Hi, everyone from uh, New York. Um, thank you for uh, watching. Um, welcome at the year's first edition of the Leon Ferraro Conferences, one of our permanent programs dealing with uh, topics relevant on both sides of the Atlantic. I would like to start by um, wishing you all a Happy New Year in uh, good health and with a true renewal in all aspects of your life. Today, we will uh, talk about uh, international cultural relations and the profession of uh, diplomat and of cultural diplomat in the world of dramatic transformation and technological revolution. We will talk about um, European Union's soft power, uh, that is uh, European Union's uh, force, power of um, attraction, its capacity to project its values, norms, um, symbols, way of life uh, beyond its borders, and about uh, the concept of Central Europe, um, a very important uh, concept, especially uh, at the end of the Cold War, uh, when it expressed the, the ideal of a, um, an intercultural a society of intercultural dialogue, of liberal uh, democracy, and of uh, modern creativity. Uh, and we have uh, the pleasure to have this uh, conversation with uh, two outstanding diplomats and uh, cultural uh, diplomats two outstanding experts and in international um, cultural um, um, relations in cultural uh, diplomacy itself. And it, I have the, the, the honor to uh, welcome uh, Ambassador uh, Emil Briggs, uh, the director of uh, the um, uh, Diplomatic Academy in Vienna, one of the oldest and most prestigious in the world. Ambassador Briggs um, is a former uh, Austrian ambassador to the United Kingdom and to uh, Russia. He also served as um, a general consul of uh, Austria in uh, Krakow right um, after the fall of the Iron Curtain. He was the director of um, Austrian Cultural Forum in uh, London and uh, the head of the Austrian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, Department of um, Cultural uh, Relations. And in that capacity, he was one of the founding members, the initiators, he was instrumental in creating UNIC Global, the international platform of cooperation among uh, European Union's national institutes uh, of culture. Ambassador Briggs is um, the author of um, several books uh, about uh, the history of Central Europe, the history of Austrian modernity, about, of course, the um, of cultural diplomacy and, um, and public uh, diplomacy, uh, books that have uh, established him as one of the most important voices in uh, European culture and diplomacy today. I also have the pleasure to welcome my um, colleague, um, Michael Haider, the director of um, Austrian Cultural Forum in uh, New York, a um, seasoned uh, cultural diplomat uh, himself. He has served in various capacities, in, but generally in international uh, cultural relations in um, uh, various parts of the world, in Belgrade, in Prague. He was the director of Austrian Cultural Forum in uh, Tokyo, one of the founding members of the, the Tokyo cluster of uh, UNIQ. Uh, Mihail is finishing a very successful and highly praised tenure as the president of uh, UNIQ uh, New York, one of the biggest clusters in the world. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you for the invitation. Yes. I, will, um, I will start by um, 
uh, by asking you about the world we are living in. I mean, it's a time of uh, profound transformation. It's a, part, a time of uh, dramatic change. It's even a time of turmoil. Um, what do you think, uh, how this would change the, prof the diplomatic profession itself? Uh, uh, diplomacy itself, uh, will it uh, be the same? Uh, will it change? How do you see this, uh, the way this transformation will, af will affect um, diplomacy and the diplomatic profession? Well, Dorian, in the eye of a storm, it's difficult to make predictions, but we are all doing it. And the prediction of most experts at the moment is everything will be different and everything will be new. <laughs> Allow me to differ a little bit. <laughs> Uh, a few things are sure. What is sure is that the global order has not been stable and fair even before the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has an, will have an impact, but this is an impact like a fire accelerating instrument. Mm -hmm. So trends which existed will become stronger, I think. Uh, so I would say foreign policies certainly change. They change all the time. Uh, the tools diplomats have change all the time. So we have many more tools than we used to have. Yeah. But actually, the role of diplomacy, I don't expect much of a change. Uh, I would say to my, my fellow diplomats, uh, keep calm and carry on. <laughs> uh, I have been in London 10 years, allow me to yeah, say. Yeah, that's right. I can tell. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, it is but not to be uh, hyper reacting to what's going on, not to, to lose sight uh, of the instruments that diplomats have been using for a long time. Uh, but we have to make sure that we are using the tools of our times to work with them. That's why there is more, more and more machine involvement in all the work of a diplomat, like it is in every the work of almost everybody nowadays. Uh, and we have to understand what this means. Mm. Uh, um, uh, just to mention very essential things like, for instance, what should we do when uh, drones are used with artificial intelligence on the warfare, war plane? How should it be regulated? Who should regulate it? How should we make sure that it is not a question of power who decides on this? Uh, how should we make sure not only the big countries make decisions? Uh, what would be the role of NGOs in this? These are all fields for diplomacy. So I would say many more fields uh, and challenges, but actually we should really keep our instruments close to our chest and not lose sight of, of what diplomacy can achieve. A lot of people said uh, when, when it was not clear whether, whether Trump would be reelected that it's all transactional now. We only have to make deals with each other. But you see, last week, this week, nobody's talking about deal making in international relations as far as the US is concerned. We'll see what the Biden administration will do. But I guess we will all very much have a sigh of relief that we can use diplomatic instruments again uh, for huge issues that we have uh, about what will be the role of China? Uh, is there an American exceptionalism still? Um, poor old Europe, do we have any instrument to play a role there? Um, does it make sense that we have uh, norms in Europe which de developed with the meter in Paris or uh, the, 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 the regulation of the, of the earth in, in London, in Greenwich, does this play a role still? And if so, how can we translate it into the 21st century? So you see, uh, I'm very conservative as far as the role of diplomats is concerned, but rather radical on, on, on how we should intervene. Um, well, because you mentioned um, the European Union, and of course, uh, as uh, members of the European Union, we are always paying um, very, very careful attention to what's happening 
with European Union on the world stage. Um, how how do you see uh, how do you see the role of European Union uh, as an entity on the world stage? Um, of course, during this difficult time, because we are uh, we are. St- still not over. You see that we have a, a second wave. We have a bad surprises every day. I mean, it's a tragic time. So how do you see the, the goals and the place uh, of European Union um, um, during this time and, uh, and uh, when uh, all this will be uh, over? How do you see the European affairs and European place uh, in this respect? Well, uh, let me start by saying uh, Europe has the possibilities to be the biggest player uh, among all the big ones. But for the time being, it's not one of the big players. Uh, And we have to make sure that we understand why this is so. Uh, And this has certainly to do where culture already comes in, that all the diversity we are so proud of uh, is not very helpful in having common positions. Uh, on the world scene. Uh, and if I may remember, if I remember correctly, it was o- almost a year now that Josip Borrell, the new uh, so-called foreign minister of the European Union said, together with uh, the president of the commission, we have to relearn the language of power. Europe has to relearn the language of power. Uh, but it's like when, you, when it's dark and you walk into a wood and you shout something, that means you are afraid that something is wrong. Uh, And a little bit, I have the feeling that's what the European Commission, the European Union is doing right now at this moment. Um, uh, And in power terms, in hard power terms, uh, Europe is certainly not one of the the big ones uh, and just uh, not to leave out Brexit, uh, which has even increased the problems that we have uh, with being a hard power player. Uh, so I think there, there, there is a chance that we come together, um, I see, as I see it, because of the realization. What we need in the future for a global order, which is more fair and more stable, uh, is to make sure that we do not forget culture, identities, civilization. But we can discuss this. We have to do it in a way which does not create only nationalists around the globe. Right. And uh, because you talked about power, and I think it's a, it's a very uh, valid and important point, um, of course, we all know that uh, the power mix uh, comprises um, a lot of aspects, of course, military, economic, uh, you know, diplomatic, uh, you know, hard diplomatic uh, power. But at the same time, uh, culture and, uh, and um, attraction, the, the, the attractivity, uh, of, uh, of a certain country or entity, in this case, European Union, is also part of that, uh, that mix. Um, and, and Europe has started to use, uh, to use uh, uh, cultural relations and international cultural relations to advance the interest. But um, is, um, is it enough to, I mean, would it be enough to have only in terms of power, you know, to have only military power or economic power in order to advance the European interest. Do we really need culture in order to do that? Well, I think we urgently need culture to do this because uh, if we look at the European integration project, Mm -hmm. it was for very good reasons after the Second World War, mainly built on the idea of peacemaking between France and Germany. Uh, by making sure that the resources are used not against each other, the hard resources, right. stole, kill, yeah. steal um, the, the military production, uh, and, and you have it. And that was very important. Uh, and, and then afterwards, uh, for the integration project, the idea was that if we have a common area of trade and of economy, then we will grow together. But right now, at this moment, we realize that both issues are important, but not enough for common positions, for a common position, uh, also for for our position in the world. Uh, And we need to make sure that the disadvantage that we have because of of, of our smallness, of our many member countries, of our different languages and so on, is actually our strength. Uh, The question is, how can we turn it into our strength and, and use it in this? 
Uh, and I very much like this, this uh, uh, American expression by Joseph Nye uh, of soft power. I like it, I have to say. Uh, I was not so sure whether uh, uh, Hillary Clinton was so clever when she said, yes, yes, we, we Americans need smart power, which hard power plus soft power. Uh, I go rubber with Joseph Nye and say so, soft power, because what does it stand for? It says it's not something that you can immediately grasp. It's not something which, which will change the situation overnight, but it is something which goes into the minds and hearts of people. When you look into the popularity or the image of countries, most European countries have a positive image around the globe, uh, which is very different from what America can, 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 can be proud of uh, uh, around the globe or, or other bigger countries. So I think we really have uh, to uh, make the best of the strengths that we have in Europe with, with these uh, soft power activities. Uh, and, and that was basically also the reason why uh, we discussed, now it's about 15 years ago, uh, to cooperate between the National Cultural Institutes in, in Europe. We, we will talk about uh, UNIC as well, because I think it's a, it's a very in, uh, interesting case study of um, trying to use uh, soft power in order to advance the European interest in, uh, in general. Um, uh, but um, I, I'd like to, because we talk about culture and diplomacy, right? And we call, talk about cultural diplomacy, we call, talk about activities that are diplomatic, but cultural at the same time. Uh, I, I'd like to, I mean, I have a question for both of you. Uh, it's, it's something that uh, maybe it needs to be, to uh, be awarded some reflection. Um, we rarely do because we do that all the time. I mean, we are cultural diplomats, but is it in the diplomatic toolkit, do we need, do we really need uh, culture? Do we really, do we really need to do this kind of um, you know, events that are beautiful, that are smashing, that are interesting, but are they really relevant in terms of uh, the diplomatic uh, activity and impact of a certain country, not of the European Union, of a certain country? How do you see this thing? Should, should I start again before? Uh, yes, Ambassador, and then I'll, I'll go to, uh, to Mihal. Uh, there's a permanent discussion among uh, those who talk about foreign cultural policies, uh, is it for the promotion of the arts, what we are doing, or, or is it for the interest of, of our own country? So is it for the national interest or is it for, for the individual artist? Uh, and I would say uh, it is certainly both, but in a given situation where we have this sort of turmoil on the international scene, I tend to say it is more about about winning friends and influencing people. It, it's more about how can we shape perceptions on the international scene? How can we do something? It's new speak, I, I know, but how can we do something like, like uh, reputation management of countries, of situations, of how we react? Uh, how can we do, again, new speak, do the branding, the right branding? Nice. Uh, and just look into issues like uh, migration. Uh, you see there immediately, yes, a lot of hard power policies are going on. We are building walls. Uh, we are trying to make decisions how many immigrants may immigrate. We are doing integration issues like language courses and so on. But when it comes to the crunch, it's about how much of difference do we accept in a society? Um, what does it mean to have the cultural differences in Europe? Uh, I'm not so happy with some of the things that happen in Europe at the moment regarding this, because uh, without saying so, many European countries actually say at the moment we are a nation state and we expect from every immigrant that he has to assimilate. And this word of assimilation did not even work in the Habsburg monarchy. Uh, because the Habsburg monarchy was very much aware that you uh, that you should value difference, because otherwise uh, you will create conflicts. Finally, the Habsburg monarchy was dissolved because of this 
not being able to deal with the plurality of different languages and, 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 and cultural approaches. Uh, so, so I think uh, it is only possible when we discuss how much we accept something which is a bit, little bit different from us that we can really, uh, really make the, the best policy decisions. Uh, and uh, many Austrian uh, um, um, intellectuals and writers have, have written about this, uh, uh, um, how, uh, how difficult it is. Sigmund Freud, for instance, uh, spoke about the narcissism of the small differences. Uh, or, Very well put. <laughs> and we know what he means in the context of Central Europe, at least, but also also Europe, I would say. Um, but but also uh, books like Mass and Power, uh, which which starts with the sentence: "The human being is not afraid of anything more than about something that touches its skin." Mm -hmm. And then it's a book about Mass and Power for I think 700 pages, 800 pages, depends on the translation you're reading. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and you know, this is not by chance that these, has been written, these things have been written by European writers because of the experience uh, of, of this continent. Uh, and because of this, I think, uh, if we believe that it's possible to uh, make reconciliation uh, in a fair and, 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 and stable world or the possible, then we have to rely on, on these sort of cultural issues. But I guess Michael will be more practical than I was with my ideas. Well, I'm not, not uh, I mean, uh, Michael is, uh, is very active in, uh, in cultural diplomacy and maybe you have developed your own view about, uh, about your work. Uh, I mean, maybe, <clears throat> maybe I'm, even far less practical and uh, <laughs> theory, uh, allow me to come back to the idea of cultural diplomacy. Uh, so uh, culture part of the diplomatic toolkit. There is, I think, uh, at least in the last years, uh, sometimes a misunderstanding what cultural diplomacy is. Uh, one thing for sure, uh, it's not limited uh, to organizing events. Uh, and especially in a more and more globalized society, it cannot be limited to that, uh, because what used to be uh, astonishing, let's say in the 1950s, 60s, when people were not used to travel so much, uh, when indeed, uh, indeed it needed some some help by by state actors uh, to <clears throat> to bring culture, to bring cultural production to other countries. Uh, in the meantime, uh, it's pretty easy for everyone to get familiar with other cultures. And uh, I would even say it's sometimes misleading because we have the belief that we know everything about everywhere. Uh, and you just find it on the internet or at some festival or whatever it is. Uh, it's all quite familiar. Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, it's indeed misleading and it's partially quite the contrary. Uh, and that's where the cultural diplomat uh, comes uh, <laughs> into the game. And the cultural diplomat is basically, well, let's, let's begin. Uh, he's not an event manager. He's not an event agency. He's a diplomat and the first task is to understand. Uh, and uh, that's basically what we do in diplomacy, uh, contributing uh, to the better understanding of each other. Uh, and then to know uh, how to address people, what might be interesting for them, uh, how to establish contacts. Uh, all, uh, all of these personal relations, which are so essential, and uh, well, uh, classic, uh, classic diplomacy in the political field is not really different uh, in that respect from the cultural field. First of all, try to try to understand uh, the country where you uh, where you are posted, uh, and then try to uh, to establish relations and to see what might be of interest for them, and on the other hand, what might be of interest for you, and uh, well, the outcome is uh, is then uh, definitely an interesting one. Uh, the uh, Emil, you uh, you mentioned one very important aspect that's uh, to value the difference and uh, that's 
that's I think also one of the of the crucial points in cultural diplomacy. We value the difference. We are able to see the difference, and uh, maybe that comes uh, from my experience in Japan. And sometimes the more different things are, uh, the the more it offers an opportunity of mutual understanding. But um, uh, um, Michael, uh, because you, you mentioned uh, Japan, and I've always been um, in interested to ask you, even though we talk a lot, as uh, working together on several projects and in the unique uh, New York cluster, I've always wanted to ask you, uh, as a practitioner of public and cultural diplomacy, uh, as sometimes an organizer of event, <laughs> you know, it goes with the goes with the trade uh, and serving in so different places, you know, in the, in the mm. Balkans, right, in Central Europe, uh, in, uh, you know, in Far East, in, in Asia, in Japan, right, and now in the United States. How, how is it to uh, conduct cultural diplomacy in such a different places? Are there uh, differences in approach? I mean, you have to employ uh, radical difference, or is pretty much the same thing with marginal difference? How do you see it from your experience? From my experience, uh, there are some mechanisms which are always the same. I mean, there is uh, that, that's what we are trained for. Uh, we know how to uh, we know how to approach people. Uh, we uh, we are aware of which cultural institutions, uh, which actors are. Uh, are interesting uh, and uh, and we and to begin with, I mean, first of all, you have to know your own culture and uh, you have to know the people in your own country before you can you can start to deal with others. Uh, so that's I think that's basically the same in uh, at each different place. Of course, the uh, <clears throat> of course it's it's completely different. Uh, Depending in, in which kind of society, uh, uh, in in which kind of, of, of country you're working, uh, and uh, and what you are supposed to do and what you can do, uh, don't take me wrong. Uh, organizing events is of course part of, of, of what we do. So it's not on the. Because we do that all the time. <laughs> Uh, but uh, <clears throat> forgive me, it's, uh, it's of course a huge difference uh, how to organize an event, let's say, in a neighboring state and uh, mm -hmm. how to organize it uh, if you come from Austria and if you have to do that uh, in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's evident. On the, uh, on the other hand, uh, dealing with uh, trying to understand, uh, which, and again, I, I think I uh i came to every place to learn and i learned a lot and uh, and diplomacy is somehow a diplomatic assignment is a little bit a cc force task uh, uh you 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 come to a place you try to understand you are learning and uh, and the deeper you you get into it the the better you are and at the moment when you think finally i know how to you are going to the next assignment uh so you, you are pushing your stone and uh but nevertheless uh well uh like like in albert camus le, le mut de Sisyphe, uh we have to imagine a diplomat to be a happy person by doing that <laughs> by doing that well this is a this is a strong uh, strong task uh, ambassador uh, you have um of course you have a, a very deep knowledge of uh, european affairs and europe you are have traveled around the world, have served in, in various um, in various postings, but um, posts. But um, uh, from your experience, uh, what do you think are the main strengths of uh, European soft power? Because we talked about soft soft power uh, uh, um, a lot, and you have mentioned soft power. Uh, what are the main things that would that you believe, and also Mihail, it's it's uh, the same uh, the same for you as well. Uh, what do you think are so you know striking that would be our major strengths as European in our sometime sometime very 
uh, disconcerting uh, diversity? Well, I think the answer is is quite simple. It's actually our our diversity, which is the main strength. We can get so much strength from uh, from uh, the experience of our history, which has always been in a history of conflicts and the reconciliation and conflict again and reconciliation uh, of state building, of nation building, uh, of new languages appearing, of uh, emigration, of migration, uh, and still the notion of Europe is something which most people know what we, when it's mentioned. Uh, so this is by far our greatest strength. And out of this, uh, of this learning process from diversity comes issues like what we think about human rights. It's very similar across the European Union and Europe, uh, or what we think about um, uh, a fair system, or what we think about democracy. Uh, this is not by chance something which has a lot to do with living with diversity and finding creative solutions to in conflict situations. Uh, uh, so I, 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 I always say I am normally against trying to impose my own ideas on others. But actually as a European, I think I do understand why we Europeans feel a bit like the Americans also, that we live in the best of all worlds and everybody else should do as we do. So this idea that we, we complain about the human rights situation outside of Europe uh, is some, something part and parcel of our own European culture, because we believe that there is something like progress in the idea of human rights, that it is possible to improve the condition of the poor, that it's possible to make it for, for, for women uh, as easy to get to the top as for men and things like that. So uh, I think our strength uh, uh, lies not so much in the Vienna Philharmonics or in the Mona Lisa, but actually in the way that we learned from all this, that we learned that, that uh, there is a chance there uh, for, for mm, big word, for, for, a, for a better better world and a better life. And that's we should promote. Uh, and it, is translated actually into real terms by something already mentioned, uh, the fact that most of the norm setting around the globe uh, relates back to European norm settings. Uh, and, and as we know, just look at uh, data protection issues, for instance. The European norm for data protection is the gold standard, which exists now. Uh, just think about things like the international law, uh, the uh, treaties on consular affairs, diplomatic affairs, they have been uh, negotiated, signed in Vienna, in Europe. Uh, so the, this is one of the strengths which comes out of having the experience of diversity is that, uh, that uh, we have this power obviously and this, and this creativity uh, for norm setting in a way which can be acceptable for, the, for, for other parts of, of this world. So you see huge tasks uh, for Europe. That's right. And I would, uh, I, I, I think you're right. And I would also add, probably we don't speak too much about it, but the very design of the European Union, I think is something extraordinary on my opinion. Um, and I'm thinking the way the decision are, uh, are made, the consensus, the reason, the negotiation, the, the committee approach, all these things that, uh, that aim at finding a decision that is not also reasonable, um, timely, but also satisfies a wide uh, array of, um, of interest is to me something that uh, that can can constitute a part of our force of uh, attraction as uh, as uh, Europeans. But the yeah, way but this, is, but this is under stress at the moment, as you know, the crisis situation is a permanent companion of the European Union. Uh, it's not getting easy, I can tell you. The multi-level governance in the European Union is very bureaucratic. It takes a long time. Whenever there is a real crisis, like the, the pandemic, immediately the nation states uh, are, are fighting back. Uh, it is difficult to get even the procurement issues of the vaccine uh, to make it on a European level uh, took a long time. And you know what happened in the last few weeks. Some member states also made their bilateral deal. 
deals uh, with pharmaceutical companies outside of the consensus we agreed in the European Union. I'm, I'm sorry that I have to, here to be so so, so sort of critical about uh, <laughs> no, my no. Own structure, but uh, I cannot accept that 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 we are not making the best of it by by saying there sometimes sometimes we have to accept that we have in Europe also national identities, regional identities, uh, and, and let us not forget this. No, it's, I mean, critical thinking is, uh, is born in Europe as well. And uh, of course, we always pride ourselves of, of you know, and using criticism in order to improve things. And of course, uh, you, are, you are right, but, you know, all our institutions are evolving. And I think uh, pan the pandemic is testing us, the Europeans, or the authorities, or e everything, every aspect of life. And also, probably, we will learn precious lessons, important lessons at the end of the, at the, end of the day. Uh, 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 Michael, um, uh, uh, going back to the profession uh, and the uh, actual practice of uh, cultural uh, diplomacy, um, we know that there are um, authors, there are opinions that um, uh, think that uh, cultural diplomacy is a form of propaganda, is a fancy world or a fancy word for propaganda, is a, a pseudonym for something that has been the same for forever, uh, in fact. Um, uh, how, how do you, uh, have you, um, do you feel yourself as a uh, propagandist while doing your uh, program? Um, how, do you, how do you respond to that uh, opinion? Uh, <clears throat> there are also people who believe that, uh, that being in favor of human rights is some kind of colonialism. <laughs> uh, uh, let's, uh, let's face it, uh, you, you, will, you will never find a consensus if, uh, if everyone uh, is happy uh, with, uh, with cultural diplomacy as such, uh, because some people uh, feel uh, somehow scared. Uh, I personally don't know why, but uh, let them be scared. Uh, propaganda. Uh, had I lived in the 1920s, for instance, I would have probably said, yes, I'm a propagandist because there was, uh, there was nothing bad with being a propagandist. Uh, propaganda was a kind of synonym of what is today elegantly called PR. And uh, well, uh, is public relations uh, something evil or something good? Uh, we could discuss that. Uh, the, uh, the idea of propaganda, of course, uh, took a, a completely different meaning, uh, well, especially with totalitarian regimes, uh, we know it. Uh, so nowadays, no, I would absolutely refuse to, to say that I'm doing propaganda. Quite on contrary, it's, uh, and especially it's not a one-way street. It's not that we are simply promoting, hooray, look, this is, this is our culture, that's the best one take it, uh, be convinced. Uh, quite on contrary, it's a far more cooperative approach. Uh, it's, uh, it's a dialogue. Uh, we are initiating dialogues. We are inviting to dialogues. Uh, and culture, <clears throat> and that's, there we are back to the notion of soft power. Uh, culture is a field uh, where people can still uh, in a much easier and relaxed way communicate with each other, which possibly uh, on the diplomatic level and even among business people, they cannot. Uh, culture can be a kind of neutral zone, to put it uh, <laughs> politely. Uh, culture is on the other hand, uh, something uh, indeed challenging where you have forerunners and uh, don't forget, culture is not limited to cultural production. I mean, it's not limited to exhibitions, to concerts, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, <clears throat> to theater productions, uh, or to movies. Uh, it also includes science and humanities, uh, and especially this, this crossover between uh, humanities and, uh, and art production, science and art production, uh, think of, uh, well, 
think of CERN uh, dealing with artists uh, and trying to uh, trying to find out some uh, some absolutely science fiction lookalikes uh, like uh, concepts of the future uh, or of understanding the conditio humana. Uh, think that uh, well uh, it was meant data protection was mentioned uh, the idea of drones of surveillance state and so on uh, things which are a threat for individuals which are a threat for societies or which might be a threat for societies well people in media arts uh, were dealing with that for uh, for decades uh, so uh, on the level of on the level of, of culture, I mean, in the field of culture, uh, is simply dealing with media artists and bringing media artists uh, together with people in the political field, uh, with lawmakers, uh, with the civil society, uh, can be helpful in understanding things that are going on and things that are processes uh, that are uh, that are deeply affecting. Uh, our life, our societies, uh, and that's the that's the soft power part. If we can act as a as a mediator, if we can initiate a dialogue, I think that's uh, uh, to put it in a pathetic way. That's one of the most noble tasks we can do to improve the conditio humana, and that's why we join diplomacy. Yeah, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad that you uh, you talked about this. Um, um, these two uh, two directions of cultural relations. It's not only not exclusively expert of cultural value events, but it's something that is about cooperation, about dialogue, something that is created um, as we go in that particular in that particular uh, countries or foreign uh, foreign uh, cultural spaces. So um, yeah, I, I definitely tend to agree with you because the doctrine uh, of um, cultural um, relations, of cultural diplomacy, there are some colleagues of us that would never use cultural diplomacy. Our German colleagues or our British colleagues would use only international cultural relations or cultural relations only to stress the fact that it's a cooperative it's a the dialogue it's not something unilateral and uh and um, um i um i i think you're right by uh, by stressing that but um of course uh ambassador briggs you have uh, written extensively on uh, cultural and public diplomacy but you you also were instrumental in creating a very powerful instrument uh, which is uh, unique. Unique for those who are not familiar with the acronym, stands for European Union National Institutes of Culture. It's a network, it's an association, it's a platform of cooperation. Um, there are unique clusters everywhere in the world, in major uh, capitals, uh, in um, major cities, in, in diplomatic hubs. Um, uh, what, why was why, why did you feel the need to create such a vehicle in uh, 2006, 2007? Very simply, because there was not enough culture uh, in the corridors of Brussels. I had the feeling that the construction of the European Union lacked cultural cooperation. Uh, and if you look into the treaties, uh, you don't find the word culture at the beginning. Uh, nowadays, it's a little bit different. So what I wanted to make, what I was really convinced I have to do is to make Europe more complicated. <laughs> and I think Munich managed to, to be helpful in this context. Uh, what do I mean by this? By saying that those political leaders, bureaucrats, also NGOs, who had little idea how different the actually uh, the individual member states have organized uh, and, and developed their own national cultures, they should have the chance uh, to see the differences. So I think from this point of view, it was successful to show 
uh, how different we have developed in the 19th and 20th century in the, our European nation states. Uh, and to make people aware of this uh, and, and to create some sort of creative tension out of this. And that was always the idea from the beginning that we, we, we go out to other places, either inside the European Union or outside, uh, not to promote a picture of Europe as a whole, but to, to, to project a picture of the problems, the differences, the, the, the diversity that we have in Europe uh, and, and how, com how complicated, but actually uh, highly productive this life can be. So it was an attempt to, uh, uh, to show that, that we are not in a, in a fruit mixer in Europe, but we have a lot of fruits that we can discuss with other people or share with other people. So that was the basic idea, uh, of, for me at least, uh, of, 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 of being one of the, of the, of the co-creators. How difficult it was to create it? Uh, I mean, in terms of negotiation, in practice. Very, dif very difficult, uh, especially uh, if you come from a small country like I did from Austria. And secondly, when you were officially part of a ministry, of a foreign ministry even, not a ministry of culture <laughs> or, or an arms length organization of, or an NGO, or I don't know, a theater company. So at the beginning, it was even rejected that, that the an organization like we in Austria could be an observer uh, of such an organization. Uh, the, at the, the very first person who discussed all this uh, was a Danish uh, uh, a cultural organizer who, who had a so-called Danish Institute in Edinburgh. Uh, and he had the idea, let's do something together. And he contacted the British Council because at Goethe Institute because these two institutions, as you already said, are very proud to be at least an arm length away from the government. So the beginning of UNIC was anti-government. Well, they, they were not uh, uh, protesting in the streets or, 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 or trying to, to put the governments in, but it was very anti-government. Uh, so it took us quite a long of, 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 of convincing them that we are not devils. <laughs> um, but actually, then we made a deal with the British Council. The British Council understood, the then Director General understood, that it does make sense uh, to see the differences in Europe as something positive. For a Brit, I guess, as we see now, it's not so difficult to understand that we have differences in Europe, <laughs> even organizational differences. Yeah. Uh, and and, and that, that was the beginning. And from that time onwards, the, during the time when I was um, working there, I, I was one of the changing presidents, the second president after British Council. Uh, and as a president, I used all the power that I had to be as dictatorial as I could to integrate organizations of very different kind who worked in the field of cultural relations as exchange from all the member countries. Uh, and actually we managed. So it was a real fight of, of, of coming together. Uh, and for me, and I think for many of the colleagues, the most important thing is to, to, under, to learn again how different the organizations in the public world and in the, in the public world, I would say in Europe were at that time. What, what was possible how, uh, uh, as far as budget is concerned, public funding is concerned, uh, uh, contents is concerned, interest is concerned, uh, whether it's propaganda or dialogue is concerned. So these sort of discussions were absolutely crucial to make it later on then possible to integrate notions of culture into the treaties of the European Union also. But, but uh, looking looking back to these 15 years of existence, I mean, in terms in institutional terms, uh, UNIC has now you know hundreds of clusters. Uh, wherever you have three national institutes of culture, and uh, you can have a cluster, you can have a common action. Some of the clusters comprise, like our cluster in New York, um, I don't know, 40 members and associate members. Uh, and there are uh, really, really um, important players in uh, cultural uh, relations. 
how do you um, how do you assess these uh, fifteen years, and um, maybe how do you see the the road uh, ahead? This is a question for both, Ambassador. Well, I, I would say there were successes and failures. And you may be surprised uh, by the failures I mentioned. The success is very simple to, to, to mention. It's simply the fact that it does still exist, is a success. <laughs> uh, but the real success is the communities uh, in the field, so the clusters. Uh, and the way they can, can autonomously organize themselves uh, and, and make choices and decisions on how they want to discuss Europe. Uh, in their given city or in their given country. This, is the, this uh, I did not expect that this was um, as successful as it turned out. Where I think unique even is over fulfilling its, 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 its uh, functions uh, is something that uh, basically I, I supported from the beginning is the cooperation with the official channels in Brussels and with the bureaucracy in Brussels. Um, when we discussed at the beginning was, yes, to get acceptance as cultural actors in the, in, 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 the, in the European Commission, we need to work with the political arms also and with the bureaucrats in our directorates, uh, certainly with the Euro external, external action service, so with the foreign service part uh, of the commission, uh, and then try to make also it possible that we get uh, uh, official funding to be accepted uh, as a partner of the EU, EU commission. Uh, and maybe it was important to do this, so we achieved a lot in this, but uh, to, to a certain extent it also it was a bondage for our hands, or is a bondage for our hands, because now uh, UNIC partly is seen as just another part of the many parts of the bureaucracy of the European Union. And within the External Action Service, uh, it is good that there is now always an interest also in culture, but it is always seen as now being part of, of the External Action Service, some of it. So, this is, is a challenge. Uh, and if, I, if you ask me, as you did, what I think where, where we have to be careful, then it's not being totally, uh, totally uh, well, eaten, well, up, well. eaten up by, by the political structure of the European Union. Even that, even that I, um, I, I, must, um, I must say that um, sometimes it's very useful uh, for the clusters, at least this is my experience in London and here in New York, to work closely with the delegations of the European Union. They are uh, populated by very competent and, uh, and enthusiastic people and they are quite useful, I mean, quite decisive sometimes in um, uh, providing the resources for the, uh, some of the, uh, the events, the actions, the initiatives that might, um, I don't know, might overwhelm our uh, capacity. Yes, but please bite the hand where the money comes from. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, poor uh, Gael, our colleague. <laughs> we, won't, we won't do that with her. Michal, uh, how was your experience, uh, the unique experience for you? You've been uh, you've been uh, working in the UNIC for uh, many many years. Talking uh, talking with with Emil Briggs and especially when when he's mentioning his uh, the Austrian presidency of what later became UNIC Global in Brussels and is now uh, a very strong institution and a known institution uh, and uh, founding that at a time uh, <clears throat> where that was not yet the case and uh, and you did some you, you did a tremendous work uh, well talking among veterans uh, i remember when i started in in tokyo to build up the, the unique cluster and my first task uh, was to convince my other european colleagues that unique a exists uh, then uh, to explain them uh, what that uh, might be good for and then most difficult uh, to participate in a cluster and uh, and to join efforts uh, and so we did uh, so is unique a success story or i would say definitely yes uh, and what a success story uh, because uh, 
there are some, uh, especially in, sorry, I'm coming back to diplomacy. Uh, there are some formats which we are used to, and there are some form of institutionalized cooperations we are used to. And uh, well, an institution is, uh, is, is nothing, uh, is nothing than a framework. It always depends on the people uh, who are who are active there. Uh, sometimes it can be uh, it can be business as usual. It can be even rather sleepy if people are not showing uh, some some passion, some engagement. And sometimes you can do quite amazing things. Uh, and that's basically what these unique clusters became. So uh, today we have with Unic Global a kind of uh, I, I shouldn't say a head office because it is not a head office, uh, but a kind of, of structure that can be very helpful and that is very helpful as long as you accept that help and no, we, we don't have to bite their hand, uh, but at least we have to shake their hand and then we have to approach them. So it's it's not for uh, it's not an automatism, uh, but once people uh, at the different uh, in the different capitals or in the different cities where they form a unique cluster, once they want to cooperate and once there is a dynamic, uh, then we can quite achieve a lot. Uh, so my personal experience uh, and the personal experience is one uh, from Tokyo and uh, apparently I have a uh, I'm, I'm doomed to uh, to be on assignment when whenever there is a disaster uh, I remember I was in in Tokyo during the, the Fukushima crisis uh, having staying in contact with with unique colleagues is something very helpful, especially with those uh, who were not only in culture, but also in science, because at some moment, especially those who were in, uh, in, uh, in the field of, of nuclear sciences uh, and uh, civilian protection and so on, uh, we could share information. Uh, and uh, we also experienced it now here in New York City. Uh, well, the, the unique cluster was for those dealing with culture uh, from the respective European states, uh, was a kind of a forum where you could always approach uh, each other, where you could, uh, where you could share best practices, uh, where you could share information, uh, and where you knew who your partners were. And uh, even though we have this, uh, well, we still didn't overcome it, uh, but uh, we even managed to, to organize some joint projects, even at the time of crisis, showing European cultural diversity, uh, showcasing European identity, or I should better say identities, in plural. Uh, and having this framework, giving the opportunity. Uh, one, I think the, and maybe the most important uh, part of this unique clusters is, yes, our members are so diverse. So we have, well, we have career diplomats. Uh, we have people who are totally from cultural institutions. Some of, uh, some of the institutions are locally based. Uh, some of them uh, are, uh, are sent from their capitals, fine. Uh, and each of them has something to bring in, and each of them has different different budgets, different uh, different methods how to how to deal uh, with uh, with issues. Uh, and together, this is making us much stronger than being just individuals uh, on a place. Well, for instance, like New York. Um, I, I, I'd like to devote the last segment of our conversation to Central Europe. I know that you both have uh, meditated a lot about this concept. Um, moreover, 
uh, Ambassador Briggs, you were one of the um, intellectuals, um, the writers who at the beginning, late 70s, beginning of the 80s, um, started to develop this um, concept that was um, a, an alternative uh, ideal, uh, an alternative vision for a, um, uh, for a region that was uh, marred in uh, communist dictatorship, uh, was uh, in, um, in uh, it was a, a uh, world of fear and of uh, grayness and of um, uh, repression. While on the country, the concept of um, Central Europe, the way you and um, intellectuals in other Central European countries saw, uh, was a tradition of intercultural dialogue and exchange. Uh, of um, liberal um, uh, democracy and uh, uh, liberal ideas and uh, in arts uh, of experimentation, of novelty, uh, of um, uh, modernism. Uh, looking back at the revisiting the concept of um, uh, Central uh, Europe, because I, I, I can't help it, you know, because I I've devoted some time myself, myself to this um, uh, to this intellectual tradition, and I'm that I am very glad to talk to one of the authors that have shaped my uh, understanding about the the region. Looking back at the concept now that uh, Central Europe has, uh, uh, of course, has ceased to to be a uh, part of it, at least ceased to be a, a communist dictator or under, under communist rule or on the totalitarian rule that is part of um, most of it part of European Union and and how do you see this um, the the promise of the concept and of the ideal and whether this concept is still useful today um, for how we live how we portray our future and our way of life, way of life Difficult question, because if you would have asked me that about 10 years ago, I might have said, we don't need it anymore to discuss Central Europe, because we have achieved so much. So we have a situation where we don't see an East-West divide uh, in the European Union, or we have a situation where uh, liberal democracy is not under, under, under stress, uh, as it looks to be the case now. Uh, now, it is, now I have to say, uh, it is very important. And I, I have a feeling I know why it's important, because certainly we try to do our best to fight against the Iron Curtain in the 80s. Very important. And nobody knows whether a, a lofty concept like intellectuals talking about Central Europe really paid uh, any sort of influence. Some people say, no, no, it was Gorbachev and uh, the lack of money in the Soviet Union. I am not so sure about this. I think uh, you have to know you have to have the seeds of the will for democracy and for freedom uh, in a society. Otherwise, these changes would not have been possible. So I'm fully fully convinced of this. Uh, and to a certain extent, these seeds of democracy sown in Poland, Romania, and other countries uh, with discussions in the 70s and 80s are now obviously necessary again. It is very interesting that with new generations coming up since the end of, of, of communist partition of Europe, uh, we need to redo re the same discussions or similar discussions about what the challenges are to democratic liberal societies. Uh, and I'm not condemning as on any of the, the governments uh, of making use uh, of sometimes political arguments, which are not so far away from the arguments communist leaders used in the 70s and 80s uh, against uh, liberal democracy. Uh, I, I don't like it, but I, I, I think we have some sort of recipe against this. And these are the, the outcomes of the liberal discussions of the 70s and 80s, what we learned at that time, uh, you might call it the creation of a strong civil society in a country like Poland, for instance, which simply makes it fortunately very difficult to become a totalitarian, totalitarian state again. 
And that is very cool. These are the things why I am convinced the notion of Central Europe, even for political reasons, uh, uh, is very important today and, and, and we should work on that. That's why the last book I wrote uh, together with uh, an Austrian friend is called Central Europe Revisited. And you know what my proposal had been when we, uh, when we started uh, writing this book? I wanted to call it Central Europe Reloaded. <laughs> So even stronger than revisited, but my colleague is is, is a more moderate person than 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 than, than, <laughs> than, than I am. Uh, I, I think it needs a reloading uh, of these notions uh, of, of of Central Europe. Uh, otherwise, uh, we will have a major problem with the European project. Otherwise, uh, we will have a project uh, where. Um, fragmentation of the European Union is again on the agenda. We will have a problem where uh, the fact, you know it better than I do, the 25% of the Bulgarian population have left Bulgaria in the last decades, uh, but also problems in Romania and, and other of these countries uh, will strengthen the idea that we have different classes of citizens in the European Union. So that we have again the Western European, uh, the, the good ones, and the Eastern European, the bad ones, and the poorer ones. Uh, and this is what Central European Europe is about. Not accepting that you can divide the European world into the good and bad ones, into black and white, uh, that you can make. Uh, we need these ambivalences. We need this diversity. And we need to find political solutions to accept the cultural diversity uh, as, 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 as one of the basic strengths of Europe. Uh, and that's why fighting for Central Europe is maybe much easier today, because nobody puts you into a prison if you ask for it. But it is more difficult because you have to find people to listen to you uh, in the given situation. I'm sorry again to be uh, rather not practical, but uh, I am, as no, you, yeah, you can uh, see, really committed to the idea. It's, a, it's an excellent, uh, excellent uh, way to um, conclude our um, conversation. We have. Uh, exceeded our time but since we are not a television you know we decide how long we talk um uh, gentlemen i would like to thank you very much for spending this um hour with our a little bit more than an hour uh, with us and our uh, viewers it's been a fascinating uh, uh, conversation um i wish you all um, well good health um, take care of yourselves uh, also to our viewers um, uh, to take care of themselves uh, the pandemic is still uh, raging on unfortunately it's still a dangerous uh, and silent enemy um, out there. Um, to all our viewers, um, um, don't miss our National Culture Day celebration. We are celebrating it on the 15th of January. Uh, it's going to be um, a concert and also a um, short film uh, premiere and original production of the Romanian Cultural Institute. So Ambassador Briggs, uh, Mihail uh, Haider, thank you very much for being uh, with us at the uh, Ferraro conferences online.